Fellowship. And um, I'm, a, yes, former newspaper reporter and magazine editor, uh, science magazine editor, and uh, was one of the founders of this program. Very excited that we're, uh, we have our third year of SHRF starting up. Welcome, welcome. Luke, you want to say hi on behalf of SEJ? Sure, yes. I'm not an executive director. I'm president of, of the board for the Society of Environmental Journalists. My name is Luke Runyon, and uh, I'm so excited that we're being able to provide this fellowship again this year. It's it's a great opportunity for, for journalists to you know, learn about beat reporting and healthcare and environment and science. And, and uh, I'm so excited to see the potential fellows in in Philadelphia here coming up in just a couple months for the SEJ conference. So looking forward to helping answer questions as best I can. Great. We also have at least two former fellows here. I'd love for them to introduce themselves. Davey? Hi, I'm Davey. Um, I, I was a SURE fellow last year. And at that, when I was there, um, I was a science reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and currently I'm a health public health reporter at the Associated Press. Uh, and I'm Zoya. I'm a staff writer at Grist, where I cover the overlap of human health and climate change. And I was also a fellow last year. Thanks for coming, you guys. And then we have a few staffers here. I'd like you to. I'd like to say hi because there are people who can answer questions too. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Acton, uh, fiscal officer for HCJ. So I will be helping with any um, reimbursements that you might need. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Cunningham. I'm going to help you with your flights and hotel. Anything operational will be me. And I think Andrea's here. There she is. I am. Hello, I'm Andrea Wainer. I'm the director of engagement for HCJ. So if you're getting emails, you're probably getting them from me. Uh, and I will be here to answer questions about the application and selection process. And Catherine, I'd like to introduce Laura DeTaro, who's recently joined the CASW staff and will be supporting all of the activities at the Science Writers Meeting. Awesome. Thanks hey, for everyone. joining us. Hi, happy to be here. So without further ado, let's just plunge in and talk about this fellowship. All right, so you've probably figured out by now that this fellowship, the National Science Health and Environmental Reporting Fellowship, is a collaboration of three organizations um, that has been going on for, this is our third year. And one of the cool things you'll discover in the course of this session today is what that means that you have three organizations that focus on great journalism, um, slightly different subject matter, but sometimes very much overlapping subject matter, um, have brought together their expertise and experience to help train journalists to report at the intersection of science, health, and environment. I've been to a lot of conferences in the last few years and have heard people say, you know, this is probably one of the most important things we could be reporting on right now, which is how environmental changes are affecting people's health um, and that intersection and what it means for understanding how to report on science, understanding how to report on health equity, um, population health, et cetera. So this is, that's why we're all excited and not just saying it either. Really, truly love this fellowship. Um, so this is just a kind of montage of the folks who have um, been part of this fellowship in the last couple years. They've come from all over the place. Um, our first year, we had a fellow from Alaska who's now in Seattle. We have a mix of media, people who are um, focused on radio and people who are focused on print and TV. So what, what platform you're working on um, is not as important as being just really keenly interested in the combination of subjects that you need to know about to report on science, health, and environment. 
Okay, why am I not advancing? Very strange. Sorry. Oh, I'm frozen. This is unexpected. Sorry, you guys. Let me stop share for a second. Figure out what's going on here. Okay, try that again. You know, I think what's going on is this admit button keeps popping up because people are showing up. Hmm. Can you share the presentation with Roz and then she'll do it? And then you can... let me just try something else here. Um, never had this happen before. There we go. It's unfrozen itself. Okay, so the fellowship, what does it require of you? The main thing, of course, is time. It is a time commitment. And it's, that means also attention, right? Because there's a variety of things that if you were to receive a fellowship, you would really be expected to commit to. And that means going to all three organizations, conferences, um, attending some webinars, doing some um, online training. And, you know, it can look like a lot to people, but it's all very much focused on using your time to the very best advantage to try to teach you to do things um, and learn from other people, even your fellow. Um, I'm going to say fellow fellows. I, there, I did. So there are three conferences this year, and Roz alluded to this at the very beginning of this session, that one of them's coming up really soon. And that's in early April um, when SEJ holds its conference in Philadelphia. Our conference is in June in New York and science writers will meet in early November in Raleigh. So we also occasionally create webinars for our fellows based on interest and need. Maybe something or someone pops up and we have an opportunity to give our fellows an to a, a chance to talk to someone or learn from someone. Like I believe it was last year uh, or the year before. I'm in a blur on this, so someone will correct me. But we had um, Caitlin Jetalina talk about reporting on um, COVID and public health and understanding some of the um, at times very confusing data ab around COVID infection and and um, public health statistics. So here we go again. Why is this doing this? Sorry, you guys. It's really weird. Can you hear that noise? Yeah. Strangest thing ever. So um, there's a lot of networking. I think our two fellows who are here today would speak to this. Really, this fellowship is enriched so much by the people who are part of it and what they learn from each other and around each other, but just sort of the fun part. Um, we also create opportunities for people to network by doing simple things like creating a Slack channel where people can talk to each other, share resources they've discovered, share stories they've reported, um, milestones, ask questions, um, it's also where we, the three organizations, will share with our fellows information about opportunities, um, webinars we think sound cool that we think you should go to, and um, just news. This, I believe, I stole from Davey. Or maybe Andrea put this together. <laughs> this is just a montage of pictures of our fellows just doing stuff together. It's not required, but it happens. And we love to see it because it's um, just kind of evidence of what, it's really proof of what we hope this fellowship does every year, which is create this 
group of, you know, this bond, these people who can be, a, be support to each other, both as journalists, but also just with the struggles that go along with being in journalism at this time um, in the United States. You know, it's, there's a lot of, of sharing that goes on that I think is really important for people, but maybe Davy and Zoya can talk more about that. So I said that really the only thing that you have to commit is time and attention, but I really think that the, the, an essential part here is you really have to want to learn, um, and being eager and interested in just learning everything that you can from this experience. I mean, that, that's a, that's a qualification we don't put into, into writing necessarily, but I think it's a really important one. This is from a tour we did at the Calumet water reclamation plant, which is part of the big tunnel project under the city of Chicago, um, designed to deal with rising water levels, um, in Chicago and the flooding that results from extreme weather events. Um, so this is just a picture from that tour that was kind of cool, I thought. Um, but you also really have to be willing to uh, wear a hard hat. So no matter what it does to your hair. Okay. So who's eligible and how to apply? This is on our site too. But we really are looking for early career U.S.-based working journalists. You don't have to be on staff. You can be a freelancer with at least two years of professional experience. You must really agree to attend all the training events during the program year. Um, and we, as a, you know, um, a collaborative organization, will make decisions about when things should be in person and when things will be virtual. We hope that everything, um, with the exception of webinars, of course, you know, we we hope everything will be in person. That will continue to be in a public health climate, at least for now, where we can be together. So everyone who applies has to ask for a letter of recommendation, either from you know an editor or a producer or a regular client. And this is really where we ask employers to pledge their support for the fellow to participate in all of the events that are part of the fellowship year. And we're really committed at AHCJ um, and um, the Council for Advancement of Science Writing and SCJ to diversity and inclusion in our programs and in the wider journalism field. So that's just a thing to know about us. So the application checklist is pretty simple. We'd like you to write us a cover letter and introduce yourself and your journalism background, your previous efforts at career development, and really why do you want the fellowship? We want to know why you're interested and how you think it will um, improve your work. A current resume or CV, a letter of recommendation, and two sample news or feature stories published or aired during the past year. The deadline is February 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And however that applies to you, wherever you are. And now we're gonna, um, first, before we go to questions, I was gonna ask Davy and Zoya to talk a little bit about um, what the fellowship was like for them and maybe, I don't know, like how it's changed your work, what you think is important to know about it. Dave, you want to go first? Um, so I applied to the fellowship. Um, I was entering year five of my like whole journalism career, I think. Um, and I was kind of in a rut of how to keep growing, what what I wanted to do in terms of professional development and kind of at that phase where like, okay, you're not brand new. Your newsroom isn't like constantly kind of checking in on you, but you're, you're also not so experienced that you're like, I'm a hundred percent going on my own and doing whatever I want to do. Um, and so this fellowship came up, thankfully I got it. And, um, 
I just would say, I think to like sum it up, like I don't, I cannot think of another portion of my career where I have had so much invested in me than when I was a sheriff. Like, you know, you could probably sit there and do the math on the money alone, but beyond that, like the fact that you get to go to every single conference, the fact that you have this cohort of people um, that really became some of them very close friends of mine who I'm still in touch with, people who I think I'm going to be following their career and they're going to be following mine um, for years to come and we're going to keep checking in on each other. Um, that is like just, I think, the most priceless part about uh, my sheriff experience. Um, and yeah, it just it's a great time. It's rare that you have a fellowship where they're not telling you you have to do some big project at the end. Like you're literally just there to learn, to meet people, to get training, um, all like very, the curriculum was very like relevant to what was going on. So I could go back to my newsroom and say, this is what we're, this is what everybody's talking about. Right. And I have the skills and the training to go and do a story on COVID or whatever. Um, so that was really helpful. And, you know, it was through, um, being at AHCJ that I actually met the AP editor, um, and got in touch with him and was kind of talking with him. And I wasn't sure, like, if I was even going to apply, I was very happy at the Journal Sentinel. But um, the Sheriffs encouraged me, they practiced interviews with me, all that stuff. And they were like, this is good for you, like, you should do it. I was really scared. And then I ended up getting that job. Uh, and now I'm at the AP. So, you know, even just, it was like a big year of transition for me. And I was so grateful to have this group of like other sheriffs and then also just like all the people like Catherine and um, Roz and everyone who like helps like just kind of keep us together and um, takes care of us. So I think that would be my overall review of sure. That's great. Thank you. I didn't know the story about people practicing your interview with you. <laughs> That's so cool. I love it. Everyone should have that. Zoya. I remember that well. Um, I'm going to keep this short because I have a cold and I, I'm like, I feel I'm disgusting right now. Um, So I won't subject you guys to that. But I would just say uh, I echo everything Davey said. And also the benefit to me as a national reporter, I think, was that I got to connect with local reporters in a way that I had never uh, really done in any way, in any like material way before. Um, And that was enormously helpful. I mean, I feel like I especially during a time when layoffs are rampant. I mean, it wasn't as bad then as it is now, obviously, but, um, but, you know, even then there were layoffs happening all the time. So having a community of people who are based all across the country and who can commiserate with you and, and talk to you about all sorts of things and who you can learn from. I mean, that to me, I think was the, I mean, there were so many parts of the fellowship that were so helpful, but having that community, as Davey said, was super useful. The other thing I would say is, um, not all the conferences will be equally helpful to you in your in your beat um wherever you are and whatever you do but you still learn a ton i mean the networking thing is real um it's not for the faint of heart <laughs> you really have to practice it as a skill um and if it's something that you're not super good at then i would definitely recommend you to apply recommend that you apply to this fellowship it, it will teach you how to do that on the fly um you will make connections you will meet a lot of people you will learn things that you didn't otherwise know um, or wouldn't have thought that you were interested in initially. Uh, the travel is, is I'm trying to think of the things that I can like warn you about. The, the, the travel is kind of a lot. I mean, if you're not, if you're hesitant about going on, I mean, it doesn't seem like like that many trips really, but but it is, it stacks up, um, especially with your normal duties at work um, or if you're freelancing, that also, you know, gets complicated. Um, and then I don't know if you guys are going to do it this way again, but last last year, our, our fellowship had um, a, a period of sort of intense homework in the beginning, which I found incredibly useful, but it was packed into a very short amount of time before our first conference. And so uh, if you don't feel like you are able to commit to doing a couple hours of study um, stats and other stuff that you might not normally do for your, for your normal work um, after working hours, then I would say... Uh, just be prepared for that. That that's definitely a component of the fellowship. You're doing a lot of sitting, um, but that's just what conferences are. Um, and yeah, those are all my like little like caveats. It's an amazing opportunity. I mean, I can't really even envision anything like it. I, I haven't ever seen anything like it. I mean, these three organizations came together to create to really like as Davy said, invest in you as a journalist. And so you are going to have these experiences that you might not otherwise have, and it's just a really useful 
a really useful thing. So um, I encourage you to apply and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you. Do either one of you want to talk about, because you brought up the time issue, Zoya, and Davey, we meant, we talked about this briefly before the session started, like how you talked to your bosses about the fellowship and the amount of time it was going to take and how you sort of navigated the challenges of, you know, having a full-time job. And as you point out, you know, doing a fair amount of travel and sometimes even a little homework, even though it was really good homework and really useful homework. I can chime in on this a little bit. I will say I was very fortunate. Like my newsroom was so invested in me uh, doing this and like made the time for me. And my editor was very clear of like, okay, if you have to do things for the fellowship, like it's part of work, um, do it during work hours. Um, I kind of like, I didn't realize when I applied how much traveling it was going to be. And then we got the like, oh, you're in and here's what you need to do. Um, and then I like sent that to my editor and, you know, he was just like, all right, um, we're glad you got it. But it is a lot. Like I didn't realize until I got it, how much traveling it would be, especially when you combine traveling with like your actual vacation and stuff like that. You're, you know, out of the office a lot. Um, but I would come back with a little report from every single uh, like conference we went to and things like that, just to show like, here's what I'm learning. Here's what I can teach other people in the newsroom based on what I have like got gained from X, Y, Z um, thing that we did. And I just tried to, that was my strategy to be like, this is beneficial, not just for me. It's beneficial for the whole newsroom that I can um, pass along these skills that I've gained. I don't know if Zoe wants to add anything. No, I wish we had someone who on this panel who um, had struggled with that in their newsroom. Chris was super um, encouraging. I, it, yeah, as Davey said, like it, it's not just the dates of the of the conference. Usually they had us come like a day early and it does stack up. So just be aware of that. Okay, great. Thank you, you guys. So um, anything that um, folks from other organizations want to say before I go to Q&A? And by the way, We'd love to answer your questions. If you want to just raise your hand or you can drop the question in the chat if you're feeling shy, um, either way works. Um, we're going to go to questions in a second. Anything else I didn't think of, Roz? Something I should have said? No, Lee? I'll just mention because uh, Zoya mentioned it, that the, um, the online stats training, uh, we do have it planned for later in the year during a long period when <laughs> there were, it won't be compressed like that uh like it was last year um but we'll yeah, we heard you on that <laughs> yeah yeah we we asked for feedback and then we actually listened to it and make changes yeah. yeah and that was like one of my favorite parts of sure like it was a full on it's a full on course taught by like stanford statisticians and it's like it's amazing but it's meant for journalists so yeah it's dope i didn't mean to say that it's not good it's super useful but it was just packed you know as i said in my review. <laughs> okay. I, I would just add one um, one experience from my own professional career that I think maybe would help before we go into questions. I did the TED Scripps Fellowship in 2021, um, which is at the University of Colorado in Boulder. It's a great experience, um, but it requires you to potentially move across the country to Boulder, Colorado to do the fellowship. And this is one opportunity where you don't have to totally uproot your life uh, wherever it is that you're living in order to get professional development and feel like you're advancing in your career. Um, there's plenty of other journalism fellowships that, you know, do that where you have to move to a new place and, you know, potentially spend a year or two years at a university. But this is one way that you can feel like you're getting you know, support and resources in your career without having to, you know, totally uproot, which I think is important. Um, so yeah, happy to, happy to help answer questions. So we have one question um, right now. Um, Colleen is asking, I'm a reporting fellow and my fellowship is ending soon. I'm looking for my next job. Would changing jobs during the fellowship be an issue? No, ma'am, it is not an issue. That's a short answer. Unless your next employer doesn't like that you're in the fellowship. Yeah, that's a good point. It's something you would want to bring up. By the way, 
while I was looking for a job, I got this cool fellowship. And these are the dates where I'm not going to be here. And these are the obligations I have to meet. I see we have a question about mentoring, which is something we didn't talk about, Catherine. Oh, yeah. Mentoring is not in there. Anyone have any questions on mentoring? Yeah, there's, there's just someone asked about the, how, what is the mentoring components of the fellowship. So we should talk about that a bit. Okay. I can do that or you could do that. You go ahead, Ross. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a very important part of the fellowship. So during your um, application, you'll be asked to uh, talk a little bit about your mentoring needs. And then that will help if you're accepted as a fellow, then that will help us find an appropriate mentor. You can specify, um, you know, the kind of medium that you work in, some of your aspirations and, and the kinds of reporting you'd like to do, anything you, any development needs that you feel a mentor could help with or connections. And then, you know, if you want someone who's, um, whose life experience is similar to yours, all of that uh, you would be able to put put into your form, let us know, and then we would match you with a, a senior professional um, who who can help as your mentor. Uh, Davy and Zoya, do you um, have any comments about the mentoring? What uh, that part of the fellowship that you'd like to share? Um, you're placed with like a really cool mentor. From I mean, mine. My mentor was Victoria Jaggard at the Post, and she um, was really helpful. I mean, we met once a month, and it was just like a chat between between two people. It, like there were there were no expectations really. It was just it was just interesting and and fun. And um, I can roll that answer into answering another question, which is how I've used the fellowship in my work. Which is you know that com that conversation with my mentor initially, and then future conversations I had with her, and then other fellows made me realize that no one is not no one but very few people are covering the the climate disease overlap nationally and um so i just like doubled down on that pretty freaking hard um and have been doing that since and in that way it's been enormously helpful for my work i've just been sort of just uh, like trying to make that a like a full fledged beat um and yeah to that end it's been it's been helpful i think if i hadn't been aware of how undercover that issue was nationally, I, I wouldn't have gone for it in this way, but I figured that out through the fellowship and now I'm doing it. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah, I think mentoring was kind of an underrated aspect of it, but I filled out that form like really intensely. And I felt like a lot of my desires and a mentor were taken seriously. Like I was like, I would really like to have a woman of color. Like I would really like to have someone who comes from this kind of a background and things like that. And all of that was, you know, accommodated. Um, my mentor works at um, CQ Roll Call, um, Sandhya Rahman. And so we we kind of had different, like she covers more health policy and I was covering more like basic like health stuff at the time. But I we would use our time to like go through, I would pick a couple stories and send them to her ahead of time of like, these are the things I've worked on recently how would you have done it differently? What kind of feedback do you have? And so there are things you can do like that to make um, your mentoring conversations like kind of have an agenda, like some kind of like structure to them. And she was so thoughtful. She came with notes and was like, you know, this. And we would talk about, oh, I had this trouble with my editor. He didn't really seem to get X, Y, Z. And she would tell me how she would handle it. We're still in touch. Um, she read my AP cover letter. So <laughs> she's like, really, yeah, it's really helpful to have someone like that. Cool. All right. Um, Helena, you have your hand up. I'm going to go back yes. and forth between the questions and the hands. Thank you so much. Um, my, my question are for the, the past fellows and i um, wondering if you could share an example of maybe a, a skill or, or something you've learned or are better at now after having either done the homework or had mentoring or seen. Um, like I'm curious what something that maybe you came in um, not as strong at and, and left stronger. And I wonder if each of you could share an example. I would say for me, um, my, I had some stats background and some like kind of basics of part of the stats course is here is like the weight of evidence, like the triangle of these are what studies are and which ones are the best. And, um, that, just having that like very clearly spelled out for me in that stats course was so useful. I used it all the time and it was 
um, one thing where I could go to my editors and say, well, you know, this, this study that they're citing is not the top tier research. And I still use that now because at AP, we have a, which, you know, Helena, um, but like, we have like a rotation of people have to vet um, studies, what's worth covering and what's not. So I use it more day to day now, but even at the journal Sentinel, there was a story I ended up writing about how this um, anti-abortion group was trying to do a panel for training for doctors about um, abortion pill reversal and things like that. And they had all these like um, experts um, who were talking about the quote unquote research behind this. And, and there is some research, but I was able to go to my editor and say, this study that they are citing is like the lowest caliber of like scientific, you know, scrutiny, right? It's just anecdotal just observational and we we know based off of this class that I took that like that's not enough to say we should treat people based off of this so that's probably the most concrete example yeah I have a few that's definitely one of mine I mean knowing that most studies like a, a crazy majority of studies are are fundamentally flawed and um you have to sort of like figure out how to how to weigh that as you cover um a lot of these uh new reports and analyses and whatever, uh, that was an, an important thing for me. And then, you know, just brushing up on math, that was crucial. I hated it, but, um, it was important. And then, um, you know, this, I'm not saying this to be like, to call anyone out or like be mean. There was a member of our group who didn't like know some like basic fundamentals about how climate change works. And they learned that through this fellowship, um, cause they didn't cover that, that topic extensively. Um, so, I think that was really important for them. And, and the same thing applies, you know, to me with math or um, a lot of like, let's see, what else did I learn? I, I, oh yeah, like how to cover, how to figure out and like navigate uh, databases. That was also really important. How to use like, like I remembered how to use like basic like Excel functions with data. That was also crucial. Um, so, so that kind of stuff, you'll just brush up on a bunch of really important um, skills. And a lot of those skills happen in person right before the conference begins. That's why you come a day early. So you sit down with these experts and they they walk you through it. And that is like such a gift. Thank you. So there's a question here that I think is probably on a lot of people's minds, which is how do you balance the fellowship and a full-time on staff job? Maybe Soya, do you wanna briefly mention like what that was like for you? Um, Dave, I forget what your workload was like, um, during the fellowship, but mine was, I mean, Grist is really flexible. I, I just feel very grateful that I have a news newsroom that does, that's like, if you need to publish, you know, not publish this week or whatever, it's, it's okay. Um, I know that's not the case for a lot of people though. So I, I just can't really speak to that part. I was kind of in the middle. Like I, w I was at a daily paper at the time. So like, obviously I had deadlines, but my beat, the way it was handled in my newsroom was not like you have to fill the paper or turn stories. Like there were people in our fellowship, other sheriffs who would be working at the conferences. They would, they just had no option, but to like get a story done or do things like that. Um, so thankfully I didn't have to deal with that as much, but I would say my like production, it was a little bit lower. Like I was number of stories was a little bit lower because I was traveling so much. But then when I was back in the newsroom, you know, I was able to kind of do things a little bit faster with the new skills that I had. Um, but again, it's like, I think he is reminding your editors why this is important, why this is, um, how it connects to your beat and maybe even coming out of it with like a couple like solid ideas that you can just go after, um, anything that shows just the value of the fact that like you're taking some time out of the newsroom. Right. Right. And those of us behind the scenes who are kind of running the fellowship are know that you are you know working full time and and um try to make as many accommodations as we can you know while while we want you to be able to give your full attention to people we've invited to speak and to fully participate in sessions at our conferences you know i, I can't think of the number of times um sure fellows would come up to me and say i'm gonna have to run out and take a call because it's an interview you're working journalists, and that's just something that we expect that you will have to do. Um, Davy and Zoya, have you published any work that was inspired by something you learned from the fellowship? Um, you've already commented on how, on how the expertise has affected the way you interact with in your newsrooms about, you know, for example, studies. But 
how about stories? Can you think of a story or stories that you did that were directly inspired by the fellowship? I just dropped a link in the chat, which is a, a collaboration that I organized between Grist and the AP on uh, how climate change influences the spread of disease. And it's an interactive, um, like highly designed web piece um, that I'm quite proud of. And uh, I don't think I would have done that if I hadn't done this fellowship. So yeah, I think that's probably the best example of something that I could show you guys. Thanks, Sora. Sorry, I wasn't able to unmute for a second. Um, yeah, I would say I more my stories were more kind of like, oh, we talked about this. That would be interesting to look into. So there wasn't like one big project or anything that came out of it. But I think one example, we talked a lot about wastewater and we did that tour. And then one of my last stories at the Journal Sentinel was about how the state of like wastewater tracking in Wisconsin, which they're actually a national kind of like leader when it comes to that. So I just put that in the chat as an example. It's just kind of like a simple daily. It's not a huge, big um, project, but I would say it more so influenced my day-to-day -day reporting and story ideas. Great. Okay. I don't see hands raised. So let me go to this question. Um, the question is whether the strongest candidates are people who are interested in reporting at the intersection of science, health, environment, or if their work really could just focus on one of those specific beats. Roz, let me let me direct that question at you. Sure, um, it really is both. I mean, that, that's the only answer to the question. Um, I think that you should be broadly interested in, in the intersection of the, these topics and um, in particular, because I'm on the science side, we see that science and and so some of the stuff about studies and statistics is important in all three fields. Mm -hmm. So um, some people are just reporting on on health and they don't really uh, do a lot of science, but sometimes that's just because you don't know how to handle the science that's related to health. So we hope that you can find some of those skills to apply to the area that you cover. So um, I think that uh, we're all looking it's really great to find intersections between these topics uh, even if your your work is more specialized we hope that learning about methods being being mentored and thinking a little more broadly about your work will help whatever you're covering just a general answer uh, and and in your application i would encourage you to to talk about that like what your interests are and how you would hope the fellowship could help you because our interest is not necessarily in you being the most qualified fellow, but being the journalist who can get the most out of the fellowship and do the most with it, right? So it's not so much about your qualifications as your curiosity, your interest, and your ability to benefit from this. That's great. Thanks, Roz. Um, the question is, are you still eligible for the fellowship if you have two plus years professional experience, but only a year's experience strictly within journalism? Hmm. I'd say that's on the edge. Uh, yeah, I really I, want people who are solidly, uh, you know, have some journalism experience and, and are committed. Yeah, right. I think it's hard to, to sort of focus on benefit from next level skills if you're still really focused on learning the fundamentals of journalism. Um, so I, I think. Roz, I think you're right about that. Okay, let me see. Um, for folks who are working at more trade or business focused publications, uh, wait a minute, I don't think this is questions really about the fellowship. Let's see, what are some ideas that you've seen work to sell editors on an opportunity? Oh, I see what the question is. Okay, I understand. All right. So if you're working for a more trade or business focused publication, how could you sell this idea of applying for the Sure Fellowship or doing the Sure Fellowship to your editors? A lot of those trade uh, organizations and a lot, of the, a lot of the people that you cover, I think are at the conferences too. It's not just journalists at conferences or like even at SEJ, which is majority journalists, there's I think plenty of 
stuff for you to cover that's like outside of the climate space specifically or, or ways to link your area of coverage to that space. Yep. Yeah, we've had some people who, uh, I, I think we have at least one fellow who is working for uh, in a business oriented beat. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the nice thing about the, the way this is structured around the conferences is, is during the conference, you are basically going around and finding the sessions that you want to attend that you think are going to be uh, useful for stories that you would do. So you might if, if I were in that position, I would look at the conference programs and see whether there are topics and sessions and field trips and so forth that are relevant to your beat and pitch it partly on that basis, because you will go to all the conferences and have those opportunities. Yeah. I had one thing on the conferences too. Um, one of the, like, we would go like a day or two early to the conferences and have our own little curriculum beforehand. And a lot of that would kind of overlap with what the conference is, which is great because then you don't have to pick between like, oh, here are three sessions all at the same time and I can't go to one of them. So you kind of get a little bit more time to get as much of the conference as possible. Yeah, that's a good point. And this year we already know that the, our training for sure fellows will actually be the day after our conference. Um, and I'm, I'm already looking at likelihood of certain workshops that will take place on Sunday afternoon that will be perfect for sure fellows. So it's going to end up being almost like really a, a, a day and a half of what's going to feel like really perfect training for people who are at this level. Um, and some of the training that we actually kind of pulled out to offer sure fellows previously is going to be offered on um, Sunday afternoon. So we're going to have kind of the best of both worlds on Sunday and Monday for our, the fellows we select. Also it's in New York. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, okay. So I think, thank you to everyone who was answering questions in the chat about the various conferences and dates and stuff like that. Um, and I don't see any other hands raised. Are there any other, oh, wait a minute. Looks like there's a question I didn't see. It just came in. This just in. Be a question about the stipend, which we haven't mentioned. Yep. Um, is the $2,000 stipend available for all freelancers accepted in the program? Should we include a project proposal in our cover letter if we wish to pursue this? The, the answer to the first question is yes, and, and the second question is no. That, In fact, it would be great if the work came out of the fellowship, right, that, that you ended up doing with the stipend. Yeah. But part of the idea behind the stipend for freelancers was to make sure that, the, that we know that the time that you take out of your working day to do the fellowship sort of is time when you can't be making money on stories. So we want to make sure that we in some way, you know, recognize that and make sure that you have some resources to, to do some work. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, the, when should applicants expect to hear whether they got the fellowship? We're on a tight timeline um, this year. Uh, the deadline is, uh, as I said earlier, is February 23rd and Andrea, when, do we think like within a week? We Early kind of, March is what we have slated. So yeah, March, like really, first so it's, it's going to be like a week to 10 days, I think, because yeah, we have to get people um, registered for SEJ's conference in Philly, which is going to be like, like early April. Um, so we don't, we don't really have time to, <laughs> to spare. We're not messing around. <laughs> no, we're not messing around. So it'll be pretty, pretty quick in March. Yeah. And we yep. encourage anybody who is applying to make sure that you're going to be available for those two conferences that are coming right up at AHC, AHJ, yeah. as well as SEJ. And please, uh, you know, you're going to be ex absolutely expected to come to, to fellowship programming at those conferences. So make yep. sure that you do not make other commitments just in case. Yeah, yeah that's really good advice um, because it, it it is difficult for us when we've selected fellows to sort of then, yes, thank you. I'm so glad we, um, I was awarded a fellowship and I can't come for that week in June. That is just not, 
um, this is not a good situation. Um, we, that's not how we'd like this to work. Uh, let's see. Can I share the dates of the conference again? Um, there they are. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay. Everyone's so fast in the chat. <laughs> Susan, you got some shout outs there for all that you do behind the scenes. Anyone who gets the fellowship, Susan is the unsung hero of this fellowship. <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, okay. Anything else from anyone? We have a couple more minutes or we can just we can say goodbye earlier and give you more time to start working on your applications because you've been so inspired by this informational session. Last call for questions. Okay. And we will so, have this, this video will be up almost immediately, right? Yeah, it takes us yeah. about an hour. It's been recorded and it'll be up in about an hour. And um, if you want to share it with someone, who couldn't make it or you missed part of it you can catch up really quick enjoy the part where i could not get my slides to advance three times uh that was really fun but it was great to see everyone here thank you so much and good luck with your applications thanks y'all